Welcome you hairy lunatics to Werewolf the Podcast. Please go down to the description and follow some of the links. Join some of the groups. Join us on Twitter and all that kind of stuff. Share us and love us. And that, that sounds a bit weird. So, yeah, maybe just, yeah. Enjoy the story. Bye. Get this bloody thing off me, I said. I was watching blood drip from under my gauntlet to the wet tarmac of the road. I'm trying, boss, Ben said, looking at me, shaking his head as I sat on the back of the van's doorway. I didn't do no VQs as squire at tech college, did I? He tried to alleviate the tense moment with humour, and I learnt my lesson. I'd been harsh, but Ben knew I was struggling a little. He also knew me well enough to shrug this stuff off. Hopefully after this, I won't hear my greatest fear and nemesis, Karen, the real monster of HR, although she does have a cracking backside. I laughed and remembered that was an example, with air quotes, of the language and attitude that got me to see her so often for work and not for pleasure, although uh, she's still got a cracking backside. However, when told such after a particularly hard meeting, she never takes it as a compliment. Should I have put it another way, maybe? A pert posterior? A pleasant trouser peach, perhaps? Who knows? But it's led to many amusing, forced, continuing professional development courses, which I enjoy failing with alacrity. Karen, the painful truth is that they can't sack me for pretending I don't get this modern vigour for non-offence in the workplace. I'm a bit too important. I know how to do the proper thing. Don't think me crass, but Karen would not have a job without me, and after her attitude towards me the first time we met, I would enjoy making her life a little tricky for the foreseeable future. I can be a bit vindictive sometimes when my buttons are pushed, or my sprouts have been twisted. Figuratively speaking, of course. I'm sitting here covered in blood. Thankfully, most of it not my own. I've just killed lots of things. It's okay, I didn't offend them though. I mean, that would be... <sighs> I'm sorry, I can't be bothered thinking about Karens anymore. How my mind wanders at these times. Killing things is just fine, but don't upset them, that's all. Marvellous. Back to my armour and my costa. Uh, I probably need to explain what that is, don't I? That's the bit of my armour that protects and articulates the elbow of my right arm, and it had been beaten to a point where it could no longer move. It did not articulate anymore. So, I suppose by definition, it was no longer a costa. It was dinted and pounded to the point where it no longer functioned. Fighting with an arm that didn't have the correct range of motion had been rather difficult. I was lucky I was so bloody good at this kind of combat, to be honest with you. At one point, the stiff arm had become a club, and I'd beaten an opponent to death with it. It had literally become a few kilos of steel, which I simply slammed against something's head as hard as I could. And you know what? That usually does the job. My armour had been beaten to the point of not functioning through the constant pummeling of the joints in a fight. An excellent way to shut down a plated knight, for your future information... Just beat the armoured joints until they're standing or lying in a solid steel coffin. Then you've got them. My favourite weapon combination on the field against knights was a war hammer and a poignard. The hammer was used to beat the armour until it stopped moving correctly. My poignard is a pointed steel rod used to find gaps in the armour and then drive into the knight's bodies inside. It looks like a large nail. The pommel is a large flat disc I can push my weight against or use the hammer to beat to get through visors and fixings. In fact, I've often used the old hammer and hammered the poignard into a downed opponent's head just like a great big nail. It's funny how these things come to mind at surreal moments. I rather like killing knights. It was so unexpected on the medieval battlefield as they were worth so much as hostages. If they yielded to me, however... They tended to die. My indentured infantry loved that about me, which meant they fought even harder. Kill my peasant scum, and I will murder your beloved lords. 
Ah, think about that next time, you bastards. Uh, oh, sorry. Where was I? I had not been killed yet. Uh, oh, okay. I know, I might need to explain that for some of you. I am an immortal 13th century knight who's lived through a lot and for a long time. Other episodes explain all that, so please give them a listen. Um, episode 145, Oh What a Night, in particular. As I say, I hadn't been killed yet, which was nice, but my body was at the point where a fresh new buff version of it would have been rather handy. The problem with dying is that it's often linked to a rather painful time just before it happens. Mm, funny that, but I tell you what, it's not so much bloody fun for me. Anyway... The new body that comes instantly back to me is typically extremely refreshing and it would have been very useful at this point. Oh, just in case, in addition to the earlier information I gave you, you would die fighting a proper knight in their system of combat, so just don't even bother, because you just will, OK? I, for one, got my first suit of armour at the age of eight and I'd been training in war and killing people from the age of four, so you're utterly outgunned by even a mediocre like my old pal Lord Percy. <laughs> ah, Percy. You made it to heaven, did you not? You lucky bastard. Sorry, I'm rambling again at this juncture. I had to drop my beautiful heater shield after it was shredded by high-caliber gunfire. It had stood up well to pistol fire and muskets. <laughs> muskets, in this day and age. What sort of a tit would use a musket? I found myself laughing as I glanced at the sword in my hand. <laughs> oh, why am I laughing at them using muskets when I'm effectively fighting them with a sharp, heavy stick? Oh, the irony. The heater shield held up pretty well until it hit that machine gun fire. I don't know what kind of gun it was. I was busy hiding behind my shield and keeping all the bits of me I could cross crossed, so if I needed to run away, I could. I told Ben. But the automatic weapon had crumbled the shield around my arm and myself just before I got cover. I'd done this job superbly, of course. Ben smiled. I think he realised I was thinking out loud. Using guns in a sword fight is tantamount to cheating. But as the old adage states, all's fair in love and war. I mean, I could have done with a Kalashnikov or two during some of my trickiest relationships. I really could, I told the mesmerised Ben. We'd finished House 3, but I was, um... What's the technical term for it? Ah... Uh, okay. Sorry, God, there's only one way to describe how I was feeling at this time. I was absolutely fucked. Will, Fenn and I had returned to the van after finishing the house, and although things were going well in one way, they were reaching the point of no return also. Ben looked at me in a state of confusion. Hey, how's it going with those bits there? I can help if you like. I smiled and spoke to him in a much more friendly manner. The arm felt a little dead, if I'm honest. The straps were too tight, and the plates had to be removed. The blood had stopped dripping from my fingertips, which was maybe a good sign, or... Uh, who knows? Maybe a bad sign. I couldn't tell him how badly this was going, because I had no idea how it was going at all. I had to pretend, therefore, that things were going well, and... Well, how did I know? I mean, maybe they were. I'd realised we'd got much further than I thought we would at this point in the evening. I mean, I'd thought House 2 was going to be a trap, but not so. Then, I'd wandered into the third, presuming that I was captured. But no, not captured, just... <laughs> More fighting! Brrr! It seemed good, but it had barely made this much harder work than I thought it would be. It's not that I mind a bit of battle, but for his sake upstairs, five hours of combat were a little much. In House 2, I had to start fighting as well. I could taste blood in my mouth. The good thing was that it wasn't mine. Oh, hang on a minute. Is that a good thing? That's not a good thing, is it? Oh, God. Was I able to think anymore? 
I pointed towards the picnic basket of goodies I needed to hydrate. Oh, Sula lifted a plastic bottle of water and offered it to me. Those plastic bottles fill the liquid with nanoplastics and dye to ethyl exyl phthalate. That would be the death of you if you're not careful, do you know that? Could you please pass me the silver flask from the netting? She laughed and opened the hamper. It was time for the Belvedere Vodka to bring its particular zing to the evening. Russian fighters have a reason they fight so well. They have the roughness of spirit that comes with their drink of choice. After some fumbling, Sula took the cork out and sniffed the contents. Those contents must have seemed rather powerful as she shied her head away from it and coughed. <laughs> I laughed, as did she. Here you go, boss. It's good to know that you're not drinking poison, <laughs> she said. I could sense that Ben and Sula were trying to help, and I could see it. The soldiers were doing the mop-up of the building we'd just emptied, but we still had two more to go, and I still had to be able to continue. As Ben and I continued to undo the leather straps and connections of the armor, I sat and breathed. Breathing was the most wonderful thing I could do at this moment, and another sip of the hot liquor reaffirmed my state as being thoroughly... F <laughs> mm. resoundingly rogered. Eventually, the armor was pulled from my limb and thrown roughly on the floor. I yelled in pain, and after a few expletives of different vehement IC levels, it took a few moments to get myself together enough to look through blood-washed eyes at the sword, which had been perfect just a few short hours before. It was now battered and notched and would take some work to be somewhat what it was. As my own swordsmith, I hoped to get the opportunity to work on it. We'll see when this night is out. I may not get to work on anything ever again. You have to accept the odds sometimes. We were not favourites in this by any means. But by God, the British. We British, we love an underdog. I smirked. Under wolf, in this case, I supposed. I held the sword at arm's length and looked along it. It was a little misaligned now. Hmm. Well, Harry Warhammer was the next piece of kit that would have to come to hand. I turned and dropped the sword in the back of the van. Note to self, when fighting vampire nations have multiple kits, one of a thing is not enough for that kind of thing. And it may have been this amateurish mistake that counted us out in the end. I will definitely have a number of swords and shields and sets of armor made for the future after I, um, you know, if I survive this. I could make a good argument for getting a few more if I could only survive. Come on now, boss. Are you okay? Are you okay, boss? I could see Ben's concern. I was not okay. He was squatting before me now and was, uh, well... He was very concerned. I am... I'm having a... I'm having an utterly wonderful time, to be honest, I told him as I emptied the flask's contents down my throat, coughing as it caught my breath on its way out. This statement was utter nonsense, and the truth rolled into one, and we laughed. I've not been able to do this level of horrible stuff for a very long time, and to be honest, it's... it's... Well, it's rather tiring, but I do feel alive for the first time in a few hundred years. Sula was staring at Will in the back of the van. He was sitting there just rocking back and forth with his back to the doors. She looked at me and pointed at him. I shook my head. There was nothing that could be done. Fen, his guardian, stood before him, protecting him from the world. She couldn't see that. But Ben and I could. I turned to the comm unit on my neck. It wasn't there. Obviously, it was a victim of the combat. Ben, can you tell them we'll be at building four in 23 minutes precisely, please? I told him. He smiled at me. 
<laughs> yes, boss, I can tell them any other bollocks you fucking want. He laughed. Well, absolutely. But if I told them we're going to be there in about an hour, depending on traffic, it would make them think we're not taking this seriously enough, wouldn't it? Hmm? <laughs> Well, I sit in the back of the van now and all, all, all I can hear is the death and the mayhem that I've just been part of. Fen stands behind me. He looks after me as I need a few moments just to get myself together. I, I kind of expected to catch up with the things I needed to catch up with by now. Where would Sally and the... the, the the pups and my Malcolm where were the boss vamps when were they going to get into the fucking game what's that's what it felt like now a fucking game the three of the three of us were going through game levels each house had something a little more challenging as we entered it they they, they knew we were coming and what order the the cabals were being intact and how, how did they know that how did how, I have to say, the three of us had become quite an effective small unit, though. We we knew how each other fought, and Simon had taken his magic fighting quality of not being in the enemy's way one step further by, well, now not being in the way of the enemy or me. He just seemed to know where we were and or where the enemy was and filled those gaps with sharp, well, pointy metal. At the last house, <laughs> I'd been surrounded before I'd even got to the front door. By, well, I don't know, there were a lot of small red-eyed creatures with knives. They were super strong vampire toddler children and there must have been about 30 or 40 or 50 of them. They had little red eyes and overly toothy bloody smiles and every time I seemed to make one a bloody smear another two seemed to appear and find the space to stick their little sharp blades in me and bite the crap out of me. They had charged which was weird, toddlers charging, and then they'd clambered all over me and effectively covered me like little stabby biting bodies. Teeth and knives were pricking my pelt and skin. I was a dog covered in fleas, the fleas being too small to engage effectively. I was... I was effectively fucked. Then from a distance, I'd heard the charging war cry of the professor, the scrabbling clinging things had paused for a moment to see what was happening but seeming happy with the situation got back to their simple task of killing me one tiny bite or bit at a time Fen out I heard the professor yell and before I could react something red and flat like the front of a truck hit me scattering the little vampires and myself across the lawn in all directions the professor and his shield had just smashed into me I rolled along the floor in my human form, which was, well, it was a bit unexpected, and I, I eventually made it to a plant bed full of holly bushes, which wasn't nice, and carefully looked up to where I'd originally been. The little creatures were trying to attack the wolf soul. They must have been able to see him, because I suppose they're something magical, I'm not sure. Non-magical things couldn't see him. Sadly, <laughs> well, sadly for them, they just couldn't touch him, which was amusing. The terrible toothy toddlers leapt at and through the soul. A, a werewolf was definitely their target, and they thought Fen was that werewolf. That professor is a right clever lad, isn't he? Knives slashed through the air and tiny teeth gnashed as the tots screeched and cried at their lack of success. Fen was more than amused as they fell over each other and threw themselves at ghostly him. They were doing each other much more serious damage in the process. The unfortunate fleas had started to ignore the professor, but he was swatting away at them left and right with his flashing blade. He was butchering the little things with abject pleasure at each kill. At least 20 had fallen to his sword, but they were still trying to kill the untouchable wolf soul, which, well, it was quite amusing. You have to admire their tenacity. I tried to get to my feet to join in, but the professor quickly motioned for me to stay down. I took the order of well and sat to watch, taking a blade of grass to chew from the edge of the border. After a few more bloody swings, the professor finished the last of the little creatures, and then Fen sat down, and he sat down for a moment, laughing. Well, that was ridiculous. 
he told Fenn as he picked up the separated head of one of the dead vampire kids. He looked at it closely, poking its nose with a finger, and then kind of eventually used it as a sick hand puppet. He turned it to the wolf soul and, with some, I must admit, expertise, performed a fine bit of ventriloquism. Er, er, where's my mother? I got her gear, I got her gear. He made the head say in a childish voice. The two of them giggled and then laughed, which was suddenly could tell quickly when the lawn at Simon's feet was torn apart by automatic gunfire. He went down on his face, swearing vociferously while covering his head and upper body with his shield. Fenn's head pinpointed the shooter and then he ran at me and then into me. We transformed into the werewolf and leapt up, crashing through the second story window where the gunfire was coming from and landed in the arms of two somewhat shocked vampires using the weapon. They then became a bloody pulp as I tore and shredded them with, well, vindictive glee. The Professor. I lay under my shield waiting for it and me to be perforated. I could feel the impact in the lawn around me as dull thuds. The gunfire then suddenly stopped. I slowly moved the shield from my head and put it above my horizontal body like a raised umbrella. The shield faced the guns. I laid behind it and started rolling sideways, roly-poly style, with it hiding me. It was not the most dignified way to get out of the line of sight, but it worked. I eventually dropped into a flower bed and found some more begonias under my good hidey rhododendron bushes. Vampires seem to like begonias. Hmm. Maybe it's just a coincidence. Probably is. The window that had once been the sight of my shooter suddenly vomited a lot of blood and snot interspersed with limbs. Will had got in then, and the attacker had been asked to leave. The liquefied bodies, or body, or who knew, poured down from the front of the house like some strange waterfall for a few seconds. Gosh, that was a lot. A lot of... Mm whatever it was. Then something else launched from the window, and a folded LA-27 machine gun landed in the garden. It was a British military issue. Hmm. This raises a few more questions for the future investigation. This did mean I was safe now and could get on with my job instead of hiding in the bushes. (laughs) I laughed at that. Ahem, came from behind me. It was a very unexpected ahem, I must say. I mean, it was incredibly polite, as if the ahemmer was a little embarrassed at disturbing my day. But it needed my interest, so it ahemmed away. Sat in the soil, I slowly turned to greet whatever it was that had well ahemmed me. I turned to look into the eyes. No, wait a minute. That's not this thing's eye level. What, what is it? Ah, uh, I initially stared into the belly of a giant. An average man's eyes were about belly level for this gigantic beast. Hmm. My eyes continued their journey upwards and into the face of the thing that stood before me. Well, this made things a little more complicated. Why him? Why me? I felt like shouting for Will to come and help, but I'm not a coward. This would be cheating the odds. He was the Valkalavian. I instantly recognized him from my bestiary's drawings, which I must admit were very accurate looking at this thing. He was a bodyguard of the goddess and basically a killing stroke murder machine that killed stroke murdered to sacrifice souls to Samuret. The Sumerians did things properly when they built killy beasts. He was just a really massive, muscular bloke with a lion's head and lion's paws. I am Gidjio Voston Harundakind Fultonian Brusk. You would know me as the Vulcan, the Blood Lord, or the Valakalavian. It boomed. Oh, good. This was one of those things that was so powerful it had to tell you how powerful it was before it hurt you with all its power. 
It still held its pose as I rose to my feet, brushing dirt and terror toddler from my torn trousers. I knew how to deal with these creatures. I'd met a couple of them before in the deep desert. Unlike most vamps, they're not only very dangerous, but they seem to have some idea of honor. I'd written a paper on the reasoning for this a while back that you may like to read. Huh? You don't? Oh. Well, thanks. I'm not hurt. Well, I made an argument that a creature with honor would be a better protector slash bodyguard than one without honor. I knew that these creatures deeply loved Sammy, which was probably why they were so bloody good at protecting her. There were other postulations about them and her, and I, I won't get into that. I don't want to lose the Wensleydale I've just eaten. Ah. Where was I? With this falcon. I was not in deep poo. It was much worse than that. I was sat at the bottom of the Mariana Trench with poo filling it all the way up to the top. Why, why the hell do I create these mental images? They never make things better. Hmm. Note to self. Must develop a more positive self-talk. I sheathed my sword and walked towards him with an outstretched arm and a fake smile. I am British after all. And we believe in a polite greeting and a stiff handshake. Sorry, what was the name again, old chap? I asked him. There's so much bloody noise going on here and my lugs are not what they used to be. The face of the giant sunk. He wasn't used to this kind of reaction. I should be quaking in fear and standing in puddles of my own urine or worse at this point, should I not? I knew that these particular entities were not too bright. I mean, his job was really to hit things with his giant club over the head really hard when told to do so, so he didn't really need to have a deep and inquiring mind. What did the lack of fear and lack of brights give me over the Vulcan? It gave me the ability to mess around with his tiny mind, which was my only real advantage, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. I am Gidjo Voston Arund Kinfultoni and Brusk. You would know me as the Balkan Bloodlord or the Valkalavian, he repeated, taking on a prideful, practiced pose once more. He waited for me to quail and fall in fear. I scratched my head, staring at him, confused for a moment, then did a beautiful piece of acting to fake the face of dawning comprehension. Oh, oh yes, I know you! I then looked confused again. No, 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 that was Jiglion Voston. Is he your brother? I think he's a bit taller than you, no? Oh, we had some crazy nights together over the years. Him and Honeymead. Goodness, like a bottomless barrel, he could really put it away, that Jiglion Voston. It made me feel thoroughly un-British in the drinking department, I can tell you. I burbled at the confused creature. Lord, said the giant vampire thing. He was about twelve feet tall and built like Mr. Olympia's best. He was bare-chested and wearing just about an indecently small loincloth to hide his man bits. It was far too small, and I really wanted to avoid getting a view from behind. As explained before, his face was half lion, half man. His hands were also claw-like and filled with a massive club, um, like tree thing. I have been sent to take you, Simon. Take you to her, he told me. Sorry to hear that, old chap, but I've got other appointments this evening that I really must attend to. Give me a mo to check my diary, I told him pointing behind me before running away was I creating a trap for the creature was I pretending to retreat in order to trick it nope I ran around the side of the building the giant laughed and called after me I have your sense you little coward you cannot get away from me he might be right but I'd give it a bloody good shot I'd managed to leg it round the building and onto the road where I could see the van and Sula in the distance. 
That's when I started shouting, Get the bloody van moving! As the creature rounded the corner behind me, I saw faces that had now seen Gijo's face, and because of that, they scrambled back into the van. As I ran, my heart pumping, they dived in the front, and the van started. I jumped last minute through the open back doors and banged on the side. Drive! I screamed, and again with a distant lack of dignity. Once secure, I turned to see the oncoming blood lord as the van pulled away, and I saw that we would outpace the beast. I offered a small prayer of thanks. Hey, I know he's up there, and I was incredibly grateful for this minor miracle. My stress levels fell away as we pulled away from the angry monster. I laughed and goaded him a bit with some childish sign language that I instantly felt a bit silly for doing. We were going to get away. We were. Oh, but what about Will and Fen? Mm, what about all the soldiers hiding until that bloody thing found them? Oh, well, what about them? Running and leaving them to their respective fates would have been utterly cowardly of me. And I had a reputation for not being a coward. I knew I would have to go back. A pothole caused something to roll under my foot and I almost fell. But it was actually a serendipitous moment. For some reason, I'd brought a short cavalry lance. No horse, but a lance. A plan suddenly came together in my head. Oh, this could be. This could be. <laughs> this could be one to go down through all the ages. If this failed, that would be okay because of how utterly ridiculous the idea of doing it was. I banged on a partition. Listen to me. Listen to me. Stop and reverse at it. As fast as you can. I told the now silent people in the front of the cab. The brakes were applied as the G-force pressed me into the van wall. I mentally prepared and a smile flashed across my face as I picked up the lance and made my way towards the open back doors with it locked under my arm. I took some kind of stance to support myself, locking a foot somehow into the flooring. Whatever the result of this plan, I was guaranteed one thing. It was going to bloody hurt. I banged again on the metal, and the van accelerated backwards towards the giant. Oh, the joy! It grew in my soul as the speed increased. Come on! I couldn't see the monster's face at this juncture, but I could see that it had stopped and started to prepare to swing its club. It was going to try and hold its ground against the van's momentum and swipe it from the road. And to be honest, knowing what these creatures are capable of, he probably could do it quite easily. What would Will say if he was presented with this problem? Ah, uh, fuck it. Yes, that's it. What the giant hopefully couldn't deal with was that just before he did the swiping thing, he would have over ten feet of medieval badass lance pierce his unarmored chest. That's what I was banking on. <laughs> I laughed out loud. This was an utterly ridiculous way to die. It was probably in the top three of my stupidest ways of killing myself, and I've done some pretty stupid things in my time. We accelerated. He tensed more and hunkered down to hold his ground. We accelerated more again. When it felt right, I banged on the van a last time and the brakes slammed on. The van almost stopped instantly, but I did not. I exited the rear of the van, still accelerating with a lance point leading my way to the creature's breast and hopefully its black, soulless heart. The sound of my war cry must have been inspirational as I flew. Oh, shit! The swipe of the club missed by millimetres, and that had been his only chance. The tip of the lance 
pierced his ribcage and slid deeper and deeper, parting the flesh, which acted only to slow down my forward momentum. Eventually, I stopped as the vambrace gently touched his skin. The falcon stood with me hanging from the weapon and looked down at me. Its face seemed somewhat disappointed. My smile fell from my face, as it seemed that sticking this massive thing through him had done... had... Well, it hadn't done as much as I'd been hoping, actually. My grip was slipping with the blood that was pumping out of his chest, and I flailed madly before falling to the floor and rolling as the van hit the vampire, throwing it and him to one side. I hadn't noticed that Ben and Sula had turned around and used the time I'd hung from the lance to get up to ramming speed and hit the monster. Good thinking, you two. The vehicle was on its side, wheels spinning. I knew I should attend to them, but also knew that the Falcon needed to have its head stoved in so that it would never get up again. Ever. I therefore got to my feet and ran over to the giant, It was lying on its back. I slipped as I got closer to it. There was a lot of blood that had come out of the thing. The blood was all black and oil-like. Thankfully, the lance had nailed it to the floor through its chest and it was pinned there like a giant scary butterfly. It was still alive and desperately trying to get the weapon out of its chest. The fact that it had lion's paws, combined with all that icky, yucky, geeky, oily blood meant that it couldn't grasp the weapon to remove it. I didn't have much time, though. I feverishly looked around for something, something I could use to remove or squish its head. My belt still had my warhammer in it. I took it out and hefted it whilst looking at the thing's head. Hmm. It would do the job all right, but it would take about a bloody hour of pounding at that skull with a tool of this size to break it. It just wasn't... You know, enough. I need it bigger and heavier. Someone's dream garden was now a nightmare garden where the Blood Lord partially lay. He didn't fit in with the decorative theme of painted cement gnomes, which were now a bit higgledy-piggledy spread around the garden, as we British folk say. The giant roared and tried to sit up. The bastard almost did it before it fell back to the ground to build the strength up and give it another go. What was I going to do? Mmm. Ah, ha, 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 perfect. There was a gnome pushing a wheelbarrow. It must have weighed at least 30 pounds or so. I yanked it up from the turf and wandered back to where Valken was lying. I stood above his head and I smiled into his eye. I will fly your living skin from your... I smashed it in the nose with the gnome before it could finish. (laughs) There was a sickening crunch as its nose broke. It roared its outrage. I hid it again. It reached for me with outstretched claws, but I managed to stay outside the range of its strikes. I must admit at this point I panicked a bit and sped the murdering up somewhat, striking the thing in the head as hard and as frequently as I could until the white stars and the fact that I couldn't breathe made me sit down and hug my somewhat bloody gnome while I tried to gather myself together again. Once the world stopped spinning and I could almost breathe, I looked down at where a head used to be. It was not a head anymore. It was the prettiest puddle I had ever seen. Yeah, flay me. Yeah, are you? Yeah, take me to Samarat, are you? Yeah, you're not, are you? Tossa! I gasped as I told the very dead giant. Some air bubbled through the body's windpipe and it gave me a little fright, if I'm honest. I responded most nobly by smashing the gnome into the mess before falling over backwards as the slimy concrete slipped from my grasp. Lying still for a moment, I looked at the stars above me gratefully and started laughing. (laughs) Bloody hell!
Ben and Sula had extricated themselves from the poor vehicle that was now lying on its side, wheels spinning aimlessly. They were a bit banged up. Sula had a little limp, and Ben's face was cut. They wandered up to me. You guys okay? I asked from my prone position. I genuinely didn't have the energy to sit up. Hopefully nothing permanent, said Sula. And we'll find boss, said Ben. What now? Well, I said, trying to sit up. Could you help me find my sword and shield, please? The job isn't finished yet. However, I do need five minutes before I go back there. Between you and me, I've yet to even get through the bloody doors, I told him. Sula, now I must get this quote correct, as it's often misquoted. You're going to need a bigger van. Um, or at least a new one. I laughed as I sat up and dragged myself to my feet to finish House 3. I have a feeling House 4 is going to be joyous. That's the end of the episode. Thanks for listening. Uh, this is Werewolf the Podcast, available in all good places that podcasts are available from. Uh, share with your friends and stuff and get us out there. It's uh, a good thing to do. There's loads of links down in the description to loads of stuff, like, for example, Greg's books. Um, he's the, the man who plays the professor. Um, and they're very good, so go read them. Um, go and follow us on Spotify, please, because it really helps out the algorithm. And more mad people can find this who are affected by the moon. Love you all, you lunatics, and may your week be a, a one of special... <laughs> <laughs>